largest organ out of all of our body systems? It's our skin. And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today with the ATIT's version 7 human anatomy and physiology portion of the exam, focusing on the integumentary system. Let's get started. Let's talk about the skin. Being the largest organ, it's quite appropriate that it belongs to a system with such an extensive name, the integumentary system. But you might be asking yourself, why is the skin so important? When you think about it, there's actually several reasons why. It plays a crucial role in maintaining homeostasis by regulating our internal body temperature as well as fluid balance. The skin can also act as a physical barrier protecting internal structures and organs from damage. It guards against invasion of pathogens like bacteria and viruses, and it's the site where vitamin D synthesis occurs. Skin also possesses sensory functions. So for example, if a worm was to touch your foot, you would typically be aware of its presence. And if you're like me, you would be going running and screaming in the other direction. The integumentary system is layered, featuring various tissues as well as different cell types. Let's begin by breaking each one of these layers down. Let's start by discussing a type of cell found throughout the epidermis known as keratinocytes. Keratinocytes produce keratin, which is a protein that enhances the water resistance and toughness of our cells. These types of cells originate down here in the bottom of our epidermis, and they slowly push their way up towards the top, known as our superficial layer, where they undergo a process known as cornification. Cornified cells, hence the name of our most superficial layer, stratum corneum, means that these cells are hardened, flattened, and they are tough. At this stage within our epidermis, they are dead, which means that they've lost their organelles and they're filled up with that keratin instead. Before we delve deeper into the layers of the epidermis, it would be useful to have a mnemonic to help us remember the sequence at which these layers occur from the outermost to the innermost. Here's a mnemonic that I like to use. It's called, come let's get sunburned. The first letter of each word stands for each letter of our epidermal layers. Starting at the top of our epidermis, we have the stratum corneum. And this layer is composed of those cornified cells, those dead cells that are continuously being sloughed off so that new cells can arise from the layers below to replace them. Just below that layer is the stratum lucidium. And this is where you're gonna find that more thick skinned areas. You're gonna find a lot with the soles of your feet as well as the palm of your hands. This layer also consists of cornified cells, which is a protein that gives them this transparent layer appearance, hence the name lucidium. Next up, we have the stratum granulosum. And here, those keratinocytes push up from those lower layers and they begin to flatten out and begin to accumulate granules as suggested by the layer's name. These granules perform various functions, including forming a water protective layer for the skin. Those keratinocytes in this layer will eventually lose their organelles and then they're going to transform into those more cornified cells in the upper layers. Moving deeper, we have the stratum spinosum, which contains several layers of those keratinocytes, but it also has it's a particular type of cell called the Langerhans cell. These Langerhans cells that are found in this layer work similar to that of a microphage, consuming up worn out cells and bacteria. What's interesting is that the name of this layer comes from its appearance when you look at it under a microscope. It looks kind of spiny when it's stained. The deepest layer of the epidermis is called the stratum bacillae. It consists of a single layer of basal cells, which are constantly undergoing mitosis to produce new keratinocytes, which are then gonna migrate upward to the more higher levels. If you have thick skin on maybe your feet or even maybe a callus on your palm, it's likely due to the stratum bacillae layer. It responds to those frequent abrasions by producing more cells, thereby thickening that stratum corneum above it. Additionally, the stratum bacillae is going to contain melanocytes, which produce melanin. That's a pigment that contributes to the skin color and provides protection against UV radiation. The melanin is transferred to keratinocytes in structures called melanosomes. Another type of cell that can be found here are Merkel cells, whose precise function is still under study, but it's believed that they're involved in the nervous system, particularly in enhancing our sense of touch. The stratum bacillae is the deepest layer of our epidermis 
epidermis, and it's tightly connected to the dermis, which we're going to explore next. Unlike the epidermis, the dermis contains blood vessels. It is also composed of connective tissue, a type of tissue distinct from that epidermal layer that serves to bind structures together within our body. You can think of the dermis as kind of like the glue that connects everything together. Within the dermis, you can also find things like sweat glands, nerves, as well as hair follicles, which are all integral to the skin's function. This layer is also reinforced with fibers, and there's two key types of proteins. We have collagen and we have elastin. Collagen provides more of a structural support, and elastin grants us our elasticity. These particular proteins are produced by specialized cells known as fibroblasts, which are located throughout the dermis. The dermis is divided into two primary layers. We have the papillary layer, which consists of looser connective tissue, and we have the reticular layer beneath it, which is the connective tissue that's more densely packed together. Before we move on to the hypodermis, it's pertinent that we take a moment to discuss scars. When we have more superficial cuts, it will only affect the epidermis, generally not leaving a scar behind. However, deeper cuts that do reach that dermis often result in scarring. These scars are typically going to appear distinct from the surrounding tissue because of their formation process is going to differ from the original skin structure. This difference arises because during healing, fibroblasts produce collagen, but they do not align in the same pattern that they were originally present. Additionally, features like sweat glands and hair follicles, which we're going to discuss a little bit later, are not regenerated in that scar tissue. Consequently, scar tissues usually have reduced elasticity, which means extensive scars with those much more larger wounds can eventually impact mobility. In some cases, we may see keloids, which are irregular fibrous tissues formed at the site of a scar due to increased collagen production. Now we're going to proceed to our final layer, which is the hypodermis, also known as the subcutaneous tissue layer. Positioned beneath the dermis, that hypodermis is a connective layer that links the skin to the underlying bone and muscle tissue. What's important to know is that the hypodermis is primarily composed of adipose tissue, which is essentially stored body fat. This layer plays a crucial role when it comes to providing the body with insulation. Now that we've explored the layers of the skin, let's discuss some accessory structures that we haven't yet covered such as our sweat glands. Sweat glands play a critical role when it comes to cooling the body through perspiration, which is just a fancy way of saying sweating. However, sweat glands are not the only method that the skin uses to regulate temperature. Blood vessels in our dermis can actually dilate or widen, allowing heat to escape through the skin. Conversely, in cold temperatures where we need to maintain our heat, our blood vessels can actually constrict and draw that heat away from the surface so that we can conserve it inside the body. Another key accessory structure is our sebaceous glands. These glands produce oil that's going to help waterproof and lubricate our skin as well as our hair. This oil production is vital in maintaining the health of our skin and the moisture of the keratinocytes we discussed earlier. Hair follicles, if you recall, are found within the dermis layer of our skin. Within these hair follicles, more specifically at the base of our hair bulb, cells are going to rapidly undergo mitosis. As these cells continuously multiply, they are going to push outward, driving the growth of the hair root. The visible part of our hair, known as our hair shaft, is composed of keratin and is non-living. So when we talk about nails, nails originate from our epidermis, specifically from the base known as a nail root. Just like we saw with hair follicles, this area is going to contain cells that are actively undergoing mitosis. As these cells continuously multiply, they are again going to push outward, which contributes to the growth of our nails. The visible part of our nail, known as the nail body, serves to protect the tips of our fingers and toes and is composed of those dead keratinocytes. As with all of our videos, I always like to emphasize the importance of understanding the why. Why is it essential that we learn about the integumentary system? A key reason for this is the prevalence of skin cancer. Skin cancer is the most common cancer in the United States 
Current estimates that it's about one in five Americans will develop skin cancer in their lifetime. And it's also estimated that approximately 9,500 people in the United States are going to be diagnosed with skin cancer every single day. Skin cancer can develop when the cells of the integumentary system begin to malfunction and divide uncontrollably. So for example, the basal cells in our epidermis can develop into basal cell carcinoma. It's the most common frequent type of skin cancer found in humans. Similarly, melanocytes, the cells responsible for producing our melanin, can also become cancerous and lead to melanoma, a more aggressive type of skin cancer. Squamous cell carcinoma is a common type of skin cancer that arises from the squamous cells, which are those flat, thin cells that make up the outermost layer of our epidermis. This form of cancer is primarily caused by the prolonged exposure of ultraviolet radiation, either from sunlight or even from tanning beds, leading to the DNA damage of our skin cells. And lastly, we're going to discuss burns. And in this particular situation, the skin's function is going to be severely compromised. Burns are typically categorized into degrees based on the depth of the skin that it has damaged. Burns can be classified into four main classifications. We have first degree burns, which affects our epidermis. We have second degree burns, which extends into the epidermis and the upper layers of our dermis. We have third degree burns, which is going to penetrate down into the depths of our epidermis and our dermis. And then lastly, we have fourth degree burns, which is going to go all the way down to damage those deeper tissues, potentially even affecting muscles and bones. Interestingly enough, when we have third and fourth degree burns, they can actually cause less pain than those milder burns that we see more superficially due to nerve damage taking place. Significant burns pose serious risks when it comes to impairing the skin's essential functions, such as things like fluid retention or even protection against those external threats. And lastly, the damaged skin is highly susceptible when it comes to infection. So we have to make sure that we address this promptly to prevent any other complications from taking place. I hope that this video was helpful in understanding everything you need to know for the ATITs when it comes to the integumentary system. As always, if you have any questions, make sure that you leave them down below. I love answering your questions. Head over to nursechungstore.com where there is a ton of additional resources in order to help you ace those ATITs exams. And as always, I'm gonna catch you in the next video. Bye.